And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our first panel discussion, which is titled Green and Smart Transforming India with Renewable Energy. Well, we are looking at a sector that has been growing by leaps and bounds in India, not only in terms of capacity addition, but also in terms of supply chain and adoption. And to steer us through this thought-provoking conversation, I'd like to invite on stage Mridu Bhandari. She is the editor, special projects for Network 18 to moderate this session. A round of applause for her, please. And I would also like to invite the panelists for this session. Please welcome everyone with a round of applause. Sandeep Batra, Group General Manager, Civil, NHPC. Shaji John, Business Head, Omium. Sabyasachi Viswas, Senior VP, Digital Initiative, Vikram Solar. And Anurag Garg, CEO, Jackson, Solar Modules and Product Businesses. And last but not the least, Srinath Ramakrishnan. He's the co-founder and CEO for Zetwork. A round of applause for all our speakers. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our first panel discussion tonight. Well, today India is at a pivotal moment in its journey towards a sustainable future by harnessing renewable energy. We are the third largest energy consuming country in the world, but we also rank fourth in the world when it comes to renewable energy installed capacity, and that's continuously being increased. Uh, we've also set ambitious targets for ourselves to achieve 500 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. Now, just to put this in context, this is the world's largest expansion plan in renewable energy. How can Indian manufacturers then contribute to this goal? What is the ideal energy mix for a country as vast, as complex as India? And what are the next frontiers for making renewable energy far more mainstream and economically viable? Those are some of the questions that we're aiming to answer here today on this very special panel. Thank you very much for joining us uh, here, gentlemen. And um, Sandeep, if I can begin with you. We'll go with some of, uh, you know, the, let's get an overview of things that are going on in different segments of the renewable energy space. And as far as NHPC is concerned, how are you envisioning India's green energy transition and uh, particularly, what is the role that smart technologies are playing in boosting efficiencies, boosting productivity in your green energy projects? Thank you, Mridu. Uh, as you have uh, probably already said, that uh, we are on a mission here, as said by our honorable prime minister, 500 gigawatt uh, by 2030. It's an ambitious target, but uh, we are on track. Uh, a lot has been achieved, much more needs to be achieved. But yes, as NHPC and as PSUs, we all are contributing our bit into it. And uh, we have been allotted, each, each one of us, this year, 10,000 gigawatt through REIA mode. And uh, uh, we have to appreciate that even hydro is renewable, which we do not know. In, India has been in this field for for the uh, last 70, 80 years, first electricity came into India through hydro. So we are even pioneers there also. And uh, uh, hydro will be required for integration of solar and wind. Uh, unfortunately, we, we understand th uh, the, RE energy, uh, the RE track is solar and wind. Mm -hmm. But that is not the only course. To integrate that also, hydro is required. So you have to keep that in picture. And uh, yes, a lot of private players are there who are uh, means passionately into it. Most of the PSUs have been taken on board, particularly this year. Many of them have been given 10 gigawatt uh, target. 
And fortunately, out of that 10 gigawatt, which was recently allotted, we have already uh, started work on 4,000. Next 6,000 is on track. Uh, we are very sure that with the policy uh, interventions which are happening by Ministry of Power and Ministry of Renewable Energy, uh, probably on, on real-time basis. So uh, there is sensitivity in, Indi in India and across the whole industry that this is a challenge before us. We have committed to the world and we will meet that. Right, okay, uh, absolutely. And uh, I'll pick up on that piece you said about, you know, solar hogging all the limelight. So let's bring in the solar players. Anurag, if I can come to you first. Uh, at the moment, solar energy does actually account for nearly half of India's renewable energy capacity. And as this capacity grows, what do you think will be the key factors that will define India's energy mix, the renewable energy mix, and uh, how big do you reckon the share of solar will get in the future? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mridul. And you're absolutely right. Like, uh, I was just going to say that what was solar contribution to last year's energy mix? And, uh, Can you take another mic, please? Sorry, that's not working. Yeah, yeah so uh, I think you uh, correctly said that solar is uh, you know, in the focus and uh, just going through some data few days back that last year uh, solar actually contributed 45 percent uh, to the energy mix uh, which was added last year uh, which is a great news uh, despite the fact that you know last year what we know solar uh, as such was added to the grid lower than 2022 uh, but it still contributed 45 percent of the mix so I think this is a great uh, uh, news that you know solar, which is becoming now very affordable, uh, with a lot of manufacturing getting added in India, and overall the silicon prices uh, becoming so affordable. I think solar, uh, or as such renewable, what we want to achieve by 2030 is something we can now achieve because you know uh, manufacturing is now all geared up as far as manufacturing is concerned to achieve these kind of goals. It's more on the execution side. Maybe there are some challenges as to we see how this 30 gigawatt kind of scenario, which will uh, help us achieve uh, know, this 280 gigawatt by 2030, is to be done. Because we are still 74, 75. So that 280 is still a mission. Uh, looks to be stressed, but achievable. If uh, know, all put together, we understand where are the issues uh, which needs to be addressed. From manufacturing standpoint, yes, uh, we are, uh, and the industry has come up very rapidly. Today, India is almost like 50 gigawatt of rated uh, capacities uh, in India, which has been you know, set up in a very short period of time. Absolutely true. And let's also talk about the cost of solar. And uh, uh, Sabisachi, uh, over the last decade, the cost of producing solar energy has actually gone down by nearly 80%. And that's been a huge shift, making it much more commercially viable than it was uh, when we started out. Do you think we are at full optimization of costs at this point? No, or I, what I, is the I, next I, frontier or the I, next breakthrough that we will see in more further economization of solar? Yeah, so firstly, I don't think we have reached the bottom point as yet. Uh, and you will know, you will know that, that it isn't just about cost coming down. Even the price is also, you know, uh, it's, it's extremely competitive. Uh, I come from another industry, by the way, right? So uh, I come from the digital world who has come here to transform the industry through my company. So, uh, and I've seen that, you know, what we can do. So, coming from that industry, my straightaway one word answer that uh, next frontier is innovation, right? Uh, cost cannot be the only play, right? So, uh, innovation, and when I say you know, I, uh, innovation is one word, but if you break it in different parts, uh, firstly, innovation in the product itself, the product innovation. You know, research in material sciences, there's lots of work going on where uh, a type of material has come which can increase the efficiency by significant, significantly called perovskite. You know, there's a, it's yet to be stable to be commercially sold in the market. The second is uh, innovation in the supply chain. I mean, we really, the companies like ours, yours, we really need to look at, is this the way we can address all sorts of customers? 
Is this the way it can reach to the consumers and consumers? That's to be thought about. And finally, the consumer experience, the customer experience. People like you and me, if, even if we decide to buy solar panel for our home, we don't know where to start, right? And compare, <coughs> compare that with the uh, wide good of, uh, say, Samsung and LG. When will it reach that stage that I can order it on a marketplace? It reaches me within 24 hours. Within 48 hours, it's installed, AMC signed. So, you know... How, how far away from that are we? I believe it's not too far because the likes of Amazon are already in the, in the field, not just with in the marketplace, but they are coming up with algorithms for people like us to calculate how, what will it take. Google has already made it, right? I don't think it's too far. 2024 will be very interesting where it will become fast become like a white good yeah. for people like you and me. That will be interesting. That will be very interesting indeed. Uh, well, any renewable energy conversation cannot really be complete without talking about green hydrogen, the relatively new kid on the block, uh, but the new kid that has also got uh, a 600 crore corpus in the recent interim budget, which has actually been a double of what was allocated last year. So clearly a lot of promise being put there by the government. Uh, the National Green Hydrogen Mission is, of course, geared towards making India a uh, production as well as a consumption hub of green hydrogen. How do you see that taking shape over the next couple of years? Um, and by when do you see green hydrogen becoming commercially viable? Is it likely to go the solar way, take a decade or more? Or what's the timeline you're putting to it, Shaji? Great, thank you. That's a great question because the question which we have been searching 15 years back in the solar industry, when we started in 2008-9, it was 20 rupees per unit. And when we used to buy electricity at home at three, four rupees. So the question was that, will we reach there any time? And today what we are seeing is solar reaching two and a half rupees per unit, right? And believe me, green hydrogen is going the same route. Today, you need $4 to $6 per kg of hydrogen when you produce it through green hydrogen route, which is like compared to conventional hydrogen production, which is two, two and a half dollars. That's the gap we are talking, two, two and a half dollars to four to six dollars. And I believe that it will take five to eight years to beat that two, two and a half dollars very easily. There are a few things to be done for which government has, like you told, allocated some funds to start the, kickstart the industry. That's the best government can do to stimulate the industry. Uh, there is a good amount of attraction of uh, the bidders in terms of who want to produce green hydrogen. And now we are coming up with a tender which, are, which is going to attract the bidders who will want to offtake the hydrogen. I think this is a good, good moment to bring the demand supply together, right? That is only going to dri drive down the cost of hydrogen. That way I can say that government has done a good job. Now it is up to the industry, producers and consumers and individuals like us to talk more about green hydrogen and see that how fast we can bring it to the parity level. And there are points which we can discuss how it will come to the parity level. Right, right. And Srinath, we are here at the Smart Manufacturing Summit and it's all about digital transformation. It's about switching to smarter energy management as well. Uh, how do you think Indian businesses are faring on that front currently? Are we reducing and optimizing power enough or at least taking that into account for our future plans enough at this point uh, at a boardroom level? And um, has this potential reduction of uh, utilization of power by industry been factored into our own energy plans and energy transition plans of the future? Yeah, I think today the capex to opex math for private enterprises, particularly in the in the commercial and industrial segment is working out, right? So that is why we see uh, we see a lot of investments uh, in in uh, in rooftop, in captive, uh, and also into smarter energy management systems, uh, and uh, and that's on the rise. And uh, and of course, government of India is also rapidly investing in smart metering as an initiative. So reducing TN, all of this basically means reducing transmission and distribution losses. And uh, so unhinged people are not paying for an inefficiency, and which means better return on capital employed. So, so there is definitive 
savings. There is definitive value add in terms of capex to opex cost reduction. And that is why we are seeing the private sector uh, rapidly investing. Uh, with regard to you know, these, these uh, smarter energy management systems, is it going to, uh, is, is it going to reduce our power consumption and hence uh, this whole 500 gigawatt that we are talking about? I don't think so. I mean, if you look at the per capita consumption uh, of our industry as well as uh, India versus um, US, it, it's still fractional today. And uh, we, we are talking about the rise in private sector capex. We are talking about global industrial demand coming to India. And hence, I think we will definitely consume uh, the, the, the rapid investments that we are making in this space. Right. OK, so we've got some broad thoughts from each of you. Let's uh, deep dive into some of the specifics. And uh, Sandeep, if I can come back to you, uh, when it comes to hydropower, what is the potential of pumped hydroelectric uh, storage capacities and how are we increasing and stabilizing this uh, when we are talking about more renewable energy on our grids and how do you really see India's storage capacity developing over time? What's the big challenge that you're dealing with this, at this point? The challenge basically lies uh, with integrating solar and wind in grid. These, these are intermittent, these are very variable. You cannot have a stable grid with these kind of technologies. Means if purely you look at generation through solar or generation through wind, because they do not follow the demand pattern. Demand pattern is exactly opposite of when you get sunny hours or when you get windy hours. So uh, the generation has to follow the uh, the demand. It can it can mostly cannot be other way around. Can be tweaked a little bit. Demand can be managed, but not much. So the peak hours will always be in the evening or in the morning. And yes, you can manage some on demand side, some, some management is possible. Under the circumstances, storage becomes very, very important. And uh, in storage, what do we have at present? Means uh, out of various competing technologies which are available, the most scalable, time-tested, very old, uh, mature technology available still is pump storage. I'm very, very hopeful that uh, the kind of uh, innovations that are ha happening on real-time basis, the breakthroughs which are coming, soon we will be having uh, competing uh, technology available in uh, BESS space also, that is uh, battery storage. But right now, uh, our uh, best bet still is pump storage. and. Uh, NHPC, given the mandate by the government of India, means um, they are encouraging storage in a big way because uh, it is understood that if we need to integrate 500 gigawatt into grid, we need storage and in big terms. So a lot of it will come through pumped. We are hopeful that battery will become competitive, so probably half of it will come from pumped. And later on when battery uh, battery technologies come, half of it will come from battery. Right. That is a scenario in next 10 years kind of thing, means in by 2030, 32, that kind of time frame if we keep in mind. Right. Keeping that in mind, uh, NHPC is exploring more than 18,000 of gigawatt right now, uh, 18,000 megawatt, 18 gigawatt. Out of that, we are hopeful that by 2032, at least we'll be able to contribute in excess of 5,000 megawatt, 5 gigawatt. Hmm. And uh, country will require approximately, means more than 50 gigawatt of storage by that time. Right. We should be talking in terms of gigawatt hours ra rather than gigawatt because the hours that uh, that are there with pump storage are much more as compared to battery. Battery, so, yeah. So uh, that way also pump storage is still a better technology in hand. And uh, considering that if we say that uh, 25 to 30 gigawatt will be required, by say 2030 or 2032. Uh, right. So storage optimization we, we, will will yeah, take us that yeah, long. We we believe that we'll be able to contribute in excess of 5,000 megawatt, 5 gigawatt. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. So coming back to solar, um, you know, one of the uh, tasks that the Indian government has also taken up is to solarize one crore homes under the Prime Minister's Surya Ghar Yojana. And uh, Anurag, how well poised is? Jackson to contribute to that big mission and uh, 
would you say you have a competitive advantage considering you know you're a complete solar player rather than manufacturing just certain modules yeah so i think first of all you know solar has been promoted by government uh, quite aggressively this one crore homes uh, you know pm suragar yojana uh, as i see from the industry perspective is a welcome move uh, both from industry and and consumers because uh, government uh, i think cannot do better because they are giving everything the subsidy financing you know it's only that people have to just simply apply and uh, the nominated agencies have already partnered uh, with several uh, integrators who will be carrying out these in, you know installations so i, I see this uh, means nothing better can be done now it's up to the end users to come forward and you know uh, get their homes uh, solarized because this is about sure ghar yojana um, so i'm um, yeah and i think when you talk about jackson as to how we are well placed so as a company uh, we complete the full cycle right so we we are into manufacturing of solar panels we are also doing rooftop as an integrators although we do cni largely uh, we have our partners uh, in different parts of the country who do residential uh, small scales uh, rooftops so that we reach that nook and corner of the country uh, then we do we are also you know, investors as ipp so we do our own projects uh, to contribute to the sustainability as an investor we do epc for solar as a company for people who want uh, epc company uh, to come forward do the job for them uh, and we are not only doing this in, in india but epc we are doing even international now uh and also we do onm so in a sense what i'm trying to say that you know we complete the full circle and uh, to what is left uh, in fact in terms of closing the loop is recycling and backward integration so the next which is on the chapter is the recycling which is the hot topic as to so many panels are getting added uh, in the country what will happen in terms of recycling so that's the next thing which we are exploring and then comes to the backward integration to the topic which was the first topic i was hearing is how we can become atmanirbhar in terms of components we are still uh, assembler to a large extent so we are now contemplating as to assembling capacity has already reached a good level of 50 gigawatt and it's still increasing how do we do backward integration so that we really uh, no do not depend on uh, imports uh, for uh, assembling these products which are needed for the country so i think this is uh, uh, what i can uh, say about this right right and sabisachi you want to add to that how big of an opportunity is there really in decentralized generation of solar energy whether it's rooftop whether it's off grid um, and over the next couple of years how do we gain full advantage of these opportunities whether it's with technology with innovation or right. with new ideation yeah, so just i'll just add to what anurag said look this uh, just announcement 1 crore or 10 crore rooftop and all it was a huge message but the message itself right uh, though i felt that it's a bit unusually muted it could have been 10 crore homes that would have been better right uh, uh, anyway so it's a huge message right so uh, because last two times we saw what india went on to do it became best in the world one is data 4g it's the best in the world it's it's zero cost right no other country in the world has second is digital payments right so essentially we did two things we are now top so i believe this will make us the top in the world now advantage access right every person in our country deserve access to power uninterrupted predictable as much we, as we talk about electrifying our whole country if you look at the last mile we are not there are power cuts in cities there are uh, discoms who are pretty unpredictable in terms of the tariffs they charge we don't deserve that as citizens of india so Uh, this rooftops micro grids can really change that scenario and think of that following on that the economic impact it has at the community level right apart from the green 
So it's, it really opens up a plethora of opportunities, honestly speaking. It, it yeah. does, and uh, you know, I want to pick up on that. Uh, uh, you just mentioned the digital payments that India has really made for the world. What's going to be solar's UPI moment, you think? So uh, after UPI, the moment which is coming is in the merchant of merchant commerce. You must have heard of ONDC, right? So on the same protocol, I do believe, and like people like you, we should be partnering with. Uh, it, it's the commerce uh, for be becoming renewable for the consumers, right? Okay, renewable energy, e-commerce Something platform. like that. Using the same <laughs> digital protocol, we can partner and yes. make a house solar within 48 hours. That's what right. we should be looking at. Right. Great potential collaborators on this platform here. Uh, but Shaji, coming back to green hydrogen, uh, you know, you've recently struck a good collaborative deal with NTPC. Give us a sense of what that is all about. What are Omium's India expansion plans? And what kind of a role are you going to be playing in really building the green hydrogen ecosystem in this country? Yeah. So NTPC, I should say, great partner. They have been doing excellently good to simul stimulate the market in a green hydrogen. Obviously, NHPC is following. I know that. We are talking to NHPC also. But the deal is like we won it on a competitive basis. It is for 400 megawatt green hydrogen projects across India over a period of two years. So uh, NTPC also, I should say that they have been forefront of the technology. They have adopted multiple technologies in their pilot projects, which is going to help country as a whole. Right? So that is what was a wonderful deal. And that gives us a confidence to also expand. So we are right now moving from 500 megawatt, as we speak, to two gigawatts of factory in Bangalore. I should say that our leadership, our CEO, Mr. Arnie Ballantyne, who had a great vision to set this company in India, to make this the Make in India product in India, the largest in India today, you can say, nobody else other than us who is making electrolyzer in India today. And this we are doing it really on a Make in India basis which means that 80 to 85% of our product is indigenized. We have got over 100 uh, vendors, supply chain partners developed across India, right? We are almost like 600 employees, out of which 300 are in R&D and engineering space, working in Bangalore and Chennai, right? We have got a capacity of two gigawatt, and we are well funded today with over 300 million US dollars funded by TPG Rice. So we are, here to transform this industry for sure. And the technology is great. It's a modular technology, PEM technology, very well suited to adopt green, green electricity. The fluctuation which solar and wind gives, our technology can absorb it without any issues. So that's what we see that with this kind of uh, technology, India will come to the forefront in the world to not only benefit India as a green hydrogen hub, but globally as a green hydrogen hub, uh, India will be the, in the forefront. So if you had to look at, say, the top three key drivers over the next decade for making India a formidable, uh, you know, front runner in terms of the green hydrogen space, uh, beating US and China, what are those key driving factors or growth factors going to so, be? So uh, at the big, first question, I told that the magic number of $2 per kg. When we can reach $2 per kg, I'm sure that from there, there is no looking back. So to reach $2 per kg, two ingredients are already there in India. Number one, great radiation, solar radiation, very good wind resources. They are already there. The second is very good solar capex. Today, whatever my industry friend in solar, I am from solar industry. India has the best solar capex in the world. These two are already existing. Now on to these two things we have to add. One is absolutely great technology for producing hydrogen, like Ohmium is in the forefront, like that many Ohmium should come in India so that we get electrolyzer of high efficiency, high technology, not low cost, low technology. I'm talking about high technology, high efficiency. Plus, if government and industry can come together to make the solar tariff on dollar denomination, which will ensure that you can raise fund at a lower cost. If these two ingredients is getting added, there is no looking back that in the next five years, we will beat that $2 per kg. 
All right. So that's uh, great optimism, and I hope we get there sooner uh, rather than later. But uh, Srinath, coming to you as well, how does renewable energy really help in building supply chain resilience, um, especially in these times of huge geopolitical uncertainties that we are living in, uh, in an era of very, very digitized energy management? How do you also watch out for threats, external threats? Uh, and what security measures do you recommend to enterprises in this regard? I think today, majority of the capital equipment for uh, for generation continues to be imported, and this is okay. this is where. Can you just hold them. Yeah, and this is where making in India initiative becomes really important. Uh, of course, there have been PLIs done in the past, which has boosted. Uh, capacity creation, but what needs to also happen hand in hand is uh, a conscious effort to uh, for import substitution. <clears throat> Today, not just hardware. If you look at even the energy management software, uh, today India runs on one nation, one grid, and uh, and small imbalance, and there could be darkness. And uh, having having. Indian-made energy management software, very efficient software, becomes another important step uh, to indigenize and to protect uh, the country's energy infrastructure from geopolitical risks. Uh, today, whilst the front-end assembly is moving in rapidly into India, whether it is panels or sometimes now even, even cells are happening, but uh, we need to definitely move also the back end of the supply chain into the country to be to be truly atmanirbhar uh, from a you know energy infrastructure supply chain standpoint absolutely uh, well let's also talk about the funding aspect of it now uh, the international energy agency estimates that india will need an investment of at least 13 trillion dollars by 2050 to reach its net zero targets uh, where are we going to find the money? What are some of the most innovative financial instruments in this space that companies can consider? Uh, you know, and, and when can we expect capital at affordable rates so that all of this vision that we are sharing here is actually on ground and implemented at the grassroots level? Um, Anurag, if I can start with you. So uh, I think on this, uh, you know, 2070 net zero target is first of all you know, far what we are talking like uh, 50, 50 years down the line, right? We are first we have to achieve this 2030 uh, target, which is just I would say closer, much closer than what we are talking of. Um, I don't see uh, you know, uh, fund availability as a challenge really from my perspective, maybe we'll listen from others. Uh, because today you have so many clean energy funds which are ready to invest, uh, and we already see this happening in India itself, that you know um, a lot of uh, investment from such funds is happening, a lot of acquisitions have happened from such funds uh, in terms of asset acquisition. So I think this is a very far-fetched thing which we are talking in terms of how will it happen. I think uh, the reality, uh, I would say, will be if we can do this 30 megawatt or 30 gigawatt uh, to achieve this, no, the closer mission, which looks to be uh, achievable, feasible, and as I mentioned, the manufacturing capacity is already there to you know, um, help uh, achieve such goals. I think I don't see this uh, as a big issue, frankly speaking. So unless my fellow speakers you know, have some other different views, but uh, first we have to ensure that how do we achieve this nearest goal which we have on our hand, which is like this 280 gigawatt of solar by 2030. So right. I think we'll be there uh, without any doubt. Okay, Sabisachi, on the financing front, any thoughts of uh, you know what innovative financing instruments can? Companies yeah, look apart at? from the traditional, in, you know, investments coming from foreign countries or our domestic financiers, etc. Uh, naturally, an, a consortium, an inter international consortium, is something which is needed. I believe some innovative ways, like a green bond, or something like that, if it can be set up, because that's a bond is something which looks at a longer-term 
uh, funding strategy. That's something which comes to my mind, possibly. When I look into the other areas which came a long way in the past two decades, yeah. infrastructure or other areas, these kind of bonds helped a lot. So that's something which comes to my mind, a green bond. Maybe. Right. Green bonds, absolutely, one of the ways to go. Sandeep? Yeah. If we talk in terms of uh, funding of projects which are being planned by NHPC, we are very well placed because uh, our capex will easily be met by our internal resources and even then, since we are very well leveraged as against the, the loan, uh, we can always raise public money as well as uh, loan also because very well, we are very well placed that way. But when we talk of the industry in general and the larger picture, probably I believe that uh, money has to come from the money bags. And uh, means India does, we do have a lot of, now we are in a much better position, but still money is cheaper outside. Means uh, if somehow we can have uh, policy frameworks like uh, this is basically green financing. And if at international level we can have some policy and uh, that money can be uh, tapped into uh, through FDIs, through direct investments, or through investments by them, the government there, because they also have a stake in it. Since we are talking of, of world as a whole now that we have to move towards uh, energy transition and uh, reduction of emissions. So they, they also have a stake in it. So probably at UN level or at some other international forum, uh, there need to be policies so that more of money can be tapped for Indian uh, uh, energy transition. And one, one important aspect which probably I hear, since it is about manufacturing, <coughs> the conference itself, and then smart manufacturing, the R&D is also very important, that uh, we, we have right. to stay ahead of the curve. Uh, because uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, not only perovskites, but there will be some magic uh, element uh, discovered soon which will increase the efficiency of uh, right. uh, of solar panels right. from 25% uh, to 35% uh, from that range. <coughs> uh, that, is, that is feasible. But where will we be? Will we again be following West yep. or will we be following the, uh, the Far East? Right. So our investment to R&D needs to go up. This is right time that we also lead the world where it is required. We can see that there will be technological uh, interventions in electrolyzers, in fuel cells, in, uh, in batteries, in uh, uh, solar panels. Technology yes. is going to improve in the next 10 years. Absolutely. We should also be a part of that game. That's my thinking. Thank Fair you. Fair enough. Srinath, you want to add on to the, to the financing bit? Of course, more investments required in R&D, like Sandeep was saying. What else would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, see, if you look at um, there are attractive IRRs for developers right now, and that's why you are seeing a lot of capacity creation that's happening. But one negative surprise for, for at least developers in India, as far as IRRs are concerned, is land acquisition in India. And we need to get better at that. Uh, it's, it's still challenging. It is still um, an area of concern in select geographies. We need to get better at that. The other, the other uh, so when, when IRRs, these negative surprises are eliminated, obviously, uh, the investment profile uh, uh, is attractive for investors. And second area, of course, today we are operating in a high interest rate uh, environment, uh, but I think this is going to soften over the next one, two years. Uh, this is going to bring more um, FAIs into the, into the clean energy financing segment, and uh, that's going to make the, the availability of finance even better. Right. Final word to you, Shaji. I'm not an expert in finance, but still I will add my points. Like I told about uh, the previous time I told about innovative funding through dollar denominated uh, tariffs in solar. See, that is possible because especially in the hydrogen industry, we are using hydrogen for two things. One, to export it outside to Europe or Japan to meet their energy demand. Second is in India to substitute the current import of oil, right? In both the cases, it's a good amount of foreign fund protection within India or foreign fund coming from outside. If that is the case, 
a dollar denominated fundraise for solar or wind developers will really bring down their cost. When they bring down their cost, hydrogen cost also goes down. So it's a simulation. Right? That kind of innovative finance is needed. And believe me, if us India, as all of us, if we create quality asset, have quality offtake, and have quality asset in terms of technology, fund is enough. Like he told, I fully agree with him, enough fund is there to come. All right, funds are enough. Innovation is on the way. Gentlemen,